Now, the Great Pyramid of Giza is probably the most stunning of all these ancient structures. And the, the stones are immense, and some of them were cut from a quarry that's hundreds of miles away. Ancient civilization and prehistorical technology will always be debated, but a historical puzzle that archaeologists and researchers have failed to provide a reasonable answer for is the mystery of the Egyptian pyramids. These researchers have made hundreds of trips to the pyramids, searching for any clue that would answer basic questions like, why were the pyramids built? What happened to Earth at that time? Join us as we discuss Randall's theory on solving the mystery behind the Egyptian pyramids. A bizarre tiny tunnel and two handles. As one of the most bizarre man-made monuments still in the world, the mystery of the pyramids of Giza remains evergreen. Many things do not add up. It would have been better if one of the scientists theorized that a giant spiritual being built the monuments or something epic happened. With a dramatic storyline, a good number of people would believe it. But if humans like us, not with 19 fingers or 10 toes, could pull magnificent structures like the pyramids, and more so without resources, how did they do it? The Great Pyramids were made of granite blocks and limestone blocks. The limestone blocks were the major building materials, but the granite blocks were used to build two chambers inside the pyramid, known as the King's and the Queen's Chambers. The granite blocks were not found in Egypt, as there was no record of granite being a major material found in the ancient dynasty. The builders had to get these granite blocks from over 500 miles towards the south before the inner construction could commence. The granite blocks were also used to build the roof of the king's chamber, so it held tons of limestone blocks above. Each of the granite blocks weighed about 70 tons each, and through a mysterious technique, these builders were able to lift 70 tons of granite blocks over 300 feet above ground level in probably hundreds of trips. But that was not all. In 1993, German engineer Rudolf Gattenbrink made an unexpected discovery during one of his trips to the Great Pyramids. He was checking out an unexplored little way in the Queen's Chamber. But unlike the pathways found in the King's Chamber, this little way did not lead to the outside world. This tiny way seemed to go about 10 feet into the wall before leading to a dead end. So nobody knew the purpose of the tiny way because it had never been explored before. And Rudolf could not go in by himself because it was small. So he decided to put his engineering skills to work. He created a little robot equipped with a camera and a light and small enough to fit into the tiny way. And then he controlled it. When he sent the robot into the tiny tunnel, something weird happened. Rudolph noticed that the tunnel did not stop 10 feet away. Once the robot reached what should be the dead end, it kept going. But rather than continuing in a straight line, the robot bent at a 40 degree angle and continued through a much longer section, a part of the pyramid that had never been discovered. As the robot kept going, Rudolph could see that it went on for another 90 yards before coming to a dead end. Then his camera picked what appeared to be a tiny limestone door with what looked like two copper handles protruding. Rudolph was shocked by the discovery because there was no record of any metal found anywhere else inside the pyramids. It has always been limestone. Rudolph assumed that it was a door because it had little straight lines at the edges and the protruding metals looked like handles. If there was a door in the pyramid that had metal handles, something was most likely behind it. Did the builders lock something behind it? Or were the four placed there to protect the pyramid? Rudolph wanted to know what was behind that door, so he went to seek permission from the famous minister of antiquity, Zahi Hawass. And instead of granting the thriving engineer permission, Hawass shut down Rudolph's team and sent them on their way. Zahi Hawass has been known for creating exaggerated stories from circumstantial evidence to fund mainstream etymology. Maybe the truth about the lost technology of the Pyramid of Giza lies behind that door. We'll never know if Zahi keeps up suppressing evidence. Mainstream scientists reiterated that the pyramid, built about 5000 BC to 4500 BC, took more than 20 years to build. But something was different. The outlook of the pyramid when they finished was very different from what we see in our present world the top-to-bottom structure of the Great Pyramids. After the builders finished building the pyramids and succeeded in getting a sharp point at the top, the outer layer of the pyramids was white 
instead of the sandy color we see today. The pyramid had a smooth white plaster from the limestone around it. This limestone plaster went from the base of the pyramid to the top, more than 350 feet above ground. The tip of the pyramid was allegedly covered with solid gold. But something tragic happened. A disaster that would almost thwart decades of hard work struck Egypt. In the 1200s, a huge earthquake struck Egypt, causing some parts of the outer layer of the pyramid, along with some stones to drop to the ground. Then the Egyptians at that time decided to strip the remaining outer layer of limestone from the pyramids so that they could be used to help rebuild the city. Many buildings in Cairo had also collapsed at that time. However, the earthquake did not do much to shake the pyramid. The chambers were still intact. The only part that was affected was the outer layer. How many buildings or monuments can survive a great earthquake in our world today? Although the pyramid looks small from afar, the limestone rocks used to build the megalithic monument are almost as tall as a regular adult male and two times wider, if not three. The lost technology used to lift these rocks must have been something out of the ordinary, because even in our modern world, we struggle with heavy lifting. We have seen instances where huge 30-ton heavy lifting construction vehicles struggle to lift heavy rocks. Even powerful hydraulic cranes with steel cables struggle to lift lighter rocks than the ones used to build the Great Pyramid. It had to be something else. Each stone was cut to precision, in a way that they fitted perfectly on top of each other. The builders would have used a sharp tool that could cut through a heavy rock, quickly and accurately, nothing else. Mainstream Egyptology claimed that the ancient residents of Egypt hammered a chisel into the stones to cut them. But researchers and archaeologists tried to hammer a chisel into a limestone block like the one used to build the pyramids, and they could barely make a dent in the stone. All they got were tiny bits of the chisel. The Bible recorded a period about the life of a pharaoh who had turned the Israelites or the Jews into slaves. During that period, the Bible recorded that the Israelites were made to build from morning till night. The Jews are a technological powerhouse. Could it be that the Israelites used their technology to build the pyramids rather than the Egyptians? According to the Bible, the Israelites were slaves to the Egyptians for 40 years. But get this, doesn't it seem unrealistic that the pyramids were built between 20 to 27 years ago? Just for context, the pyramids of Teotihuacan in Mexico, which are much smaller in size than the Great Pyramids, took about 150 years to complete. The engineering mastery of the Sydney Opera House took 14 years to create, and these projects use some form of equipment and technology during construction. So once again, the Egyptian pyramids had to be using some kind of extraordinary technology. In the 1940s, a British pilot and archaeologist Percy Groves was flying over the Great Pyramid when he noticed something strange. The pyramid looked different from the sky. When Groves flew over the pyramid, he noticed that there were eight sides rather than the usual four that everybody was made to believe. When he flew over it took more time for further analysis. He noticed that even from the sky, the eight sides of the pyramid were not visible till the sun rose and the sun set on the equinox. This only happens twice a year when the sun is directly above the earth. This discovery was shocking to everybody and archaeologists started to question the structure of the pyramid. Why would the architect of the pyramid draft the structure in a way that the real number of sides could only be seen twice in a year? Just for context, if you calculated the number of seconds in a day from sunrise to sunset, it is 43,200, which was the calculated base of the pyramid. This means that for every one in 43,200, or exactly two seconds, the Earth rotates at a distance of the exact perimeter of the Great Pyramid. The Earth tilts about its axis about one degree every 72 years, which is a multiple of 432. However, what is strange is that the inner chamber of the Great Pyramid has a similar frequency of 432 hertz, which is in sync with the natural vibrations of the Earth. Now, since the Egyptians had probably not been to space at that time, they wouldn't have known any of these facts. But somehow, the structural mastery of the pyramid aligns with strange calculations of the Earth's geometry as it travels around the cosmos. This means that the chief engineer and every other engineer who participated in the construction of the Great Pyramid over decades 
had an advanced understanding of maths, geology, and astronomy. In another startling discovery, a man named Robert Boval wrote a book in 1994 called The Orion Mystery. According to Boval, the layout of the three pyramids in Giza Plato may be connected to the Orion constellation. His theory was because of the way the stars aligned in the Orion belt. When viewed from above, the size and layout of the three pyramids of Giza are an exact match to the layout of the stars in the Orion belt. The Great Pyramid sits on a foundation called the Sokol, and during a field trip, archaeologists and Egyptologists discovered that the Sokol was flat to a fault. Using laser precision, they found out that the Sokol was flat about one quarter of an inch. The builders did not get any rock as flat as that. This means that before they started building the Sokol, they had to flatten the rocks. In our world today, the flatting accuracy of the pyramid base at the time of the Great Pyramid construction could only be achieved using a continued stream of laser precision. In a bid to break down this mystery and offer a more logical and less stressful explanation, a historical podcaster, Randall Carlson, proposed a theory that would solve the mystery of the pyramid construction once and for all. Randall's theory solves the mystery of ancient Egyptian pyramids. Randall's theory may be ridiculous to about 90% of the world's population because they want to see artifacts. Everyone wants to see something that shows that everything was where you said they were. That's where the pyramid comes in. Randall's theory suggested that highly sophisticated nations, probably like the Wakanda movie, ruled the earth tens of thousand years ago, even way before ancient dynasties like Mesopotamia, Egypt, and China came into play. Although natural disasters and climate change like the Ice Age pulled technological advancements back, unexplainable structures like the Pyramid and the Stone Hedge back up the ancient civilization theory. Randall pulled out the accuracy of the structure of the pyramids. The prehistoric humans had no recorded precision equipment, but how the hell were they able to build to precision the pyramids of Giza? If it took years of research and study to deduce that the layout of the pyramids resembled that of the stars in the Aries constellation, who told them of the heavenly layout? Why did they choose to build something different? There are so many questions. Randall talked about the architecture of the pyramids, especially the stones used to build them. The rocks used to build the pyramids were large and heavy, so the builders used some form of lost technology to carry them. The Great Pyramid was built by quarrying an estimated 2.3 million large blocks, weighing 6 million tons in total. Imagine humans carrying about 2 million large blocks. Randall says the pyramid architecture and technology seemed far away for these ancient civilizations, but they did it anyway. It makes you think a little bit deeper about our history and what they meant. It also makes you think about everything you learned in science. Was it all a lie? Let's talk a little bit about the mystery of the pyramids. Maybe we can crack something archaeologists and historical researchers have not been able to crack. Pyramids were built as funerary tombs for pharaohs and high-ranking officials from 2600 BC to 1550 BC. In the generational Egyptian dynasties, these monuments allegedly displayed a person's power and wealth and served as a place of ascension into the afterlife. Tens of pyramids have been scattered across Egypt, and they all come in different shapes and sizes, from the early stepped pyramid of Djoser to the uniquely shaped bent pyramid, where the pyramid angle was changed midway through construction. Many researchers and archaeologists have gone to the pyramids hundreds of times to understand their purpose and working theory, but to no avail. It brings us to the first mystery. How were the pyramids of Egypt built? The Pyramid of Khufu, which is the largest pyramid, is made of 2.3 million blocks, each weighing anywhere from 2.5 to 16 tons. This pyramid consists of unique chambers made of different stones that were brought in from another dynasty. But how did ancient Egyptians transport these stones from one location to another without the use of a wheel or any movable equipment? It remains an age-long perplexing monument that has given researchers and archaeologists sleepless nights. A theory that was found in a painting picked in the tomb of Jehutiotep suggested that the prehistoric civilization used sleds and wet sand to move materials. The painting showed men dragging a colossal statue on a sled. In front of them, 
A person pours water onto the sand before they pass. It was easy to assume the weirdness of the story the painting was telling. Some researchers initially thought it to be a ceremonial gesture. However, a recent study showed that about 2 to 5% of the volume of sand increased the stiffness of the sand and reduced the friction between the object being dragged and the ground, making the object much easier to move. Maybe that was what the prehistory civilization knew. They understood friction and used it to their advantage. If the movement of the stones provides logic to the locomotion of the stones, how did they lift them without the use of mechanical advantage? Is it possible that the stones were moved using wooden rollers or ramps? How did the wooden rollers carry 2.3 million stones without breaking? No logical answer has been given. Recently, during field research, Archaeologists made a shocking discovery inside the Pyramid of Khufu. Using muon tomography, a non-invasive scanning technique that uses cosmic rays to produce 3D images of spaces and can penetrate much more deeply than X-rays, they noticed two previously unknown voids inside the pyramid. The first void was approximately 15 feet long. It was horizontal and sloping upward like a pathway to the top of the pyramid. Another void was found above the Grand Gallery. This time it was a hundred-foot-long passageway that went straight towards the center of the pyramids where the burial chambers were. But no researcher has dared check out the large void that leads to the chambers. Nobody knows what is waiting at the other end. Perhaps it's the secret to the structural pattern of the pyramid. Or maybe there is a mummified giant with great powers holding a heavyweight structure in place. Whatever it is, I guess we may never find out. The knowledge of the pyramid is the knowledge of one of the seven wonders of the world. It should be studied. More pyramids should have been constructed. Unfortunately, the last royal pyramid was built around 1500 BC. As decades went by, some wealthy men built smaller pyramids. However, centuries later, the pyramid knowledge is extinct. Even the Egyptians had abandoned the practice. What happened to them? What were they so afraid of? There are many theories to explain these questions. Since the pyramids were allegedly for royal burials, one theory speculates that religious changes around 1500 BC began stressing building tombs underground rather than high pyramids. Another theory coined by Peter James, an engineer tasked with examining the outer casing of the bent pyramid, built in 2600 BC said the Egyptians stopped building pyramids because of the visible defects after spending time, energy, and resources to build perfect monuments. The sophistication of megalithic monuments during ancient civilization cannot be ignored. And it's not just in one place. These structures are everywhere, like a reminder that there was a great understanding of the universe before time. But does this mean that there was a global distribution of knowledge? Was the same construction principle used to build the Pyramid of Giza used for the stone circles in Egypt? The unexplainable stone circles in Europe. All the historical structures that stood the test of centuries were large structures with mysterious but similar working principles. Was there a source that the Global Engineering Society tapped their knowledge from? The heavy stones that make up the stone circles across Europe have stood in silence, not giving a clue as to how they came about thousands of years ago. They are mostly found in Britain, Ireland, and Brittany, and typically date from the late Neolithic and early Bronze Age, with most being built from 3000 BC. Stone circles are usually grouped in terms of the shape and size of the stones, the span of their radius, and their population within the local area. Popular examples include those at the Hinge Monument at Avebury, the Rollwright Stones, and elements within the Ring of Standing Stones at Stonehenge. The stones used to build the stone circles were of various sizes, but they were mostly large, meaning they were built by some kind of communal effort. Aside from technological advancement of the prehistoric civilization, they used a very important tool that the modern world still struggles to have. They had unity. Every megalithic monument built thousands of years ago was done by some form of communal effort, whatever the purpose was at that time. Everybody came together to construct these unique monuments, including specialist tasks such as planning, quarrying, transportation, laying the foundation trenches, and final construction. The earliest stone circles in Britain were erected in 3000 to 2500 BC. 
Then, communities in the coastal and the lowland areas began to build their stone circles too. But the stone circle builders also understood astronomy, like the pyramid architecture. Recent research shows that the two oldest stone circles in Britain, Stennis on Orkney and Callanish on the Isle of Lewis, were constructed to align with solar and lunar positions. The question remains, what did they know about solar and lunar positions? The average scientist, archaeologist, and astronaut made us believe that the world at that time knew nothing about the cosmos, and everybody was just happy to go about their daily lives. They claimed that cosmic research and astronomical stories only started a century ago. Maybe there were prehistoric nations with higher technological advancements who studied astronomy and had more knowledge of the cosmos than our modern world. There are approximately 1,300 stone circles in Britain and Ireland. That's a large number. It means that the ancient European civilizations continued building these monuments across vast areas, from generation to generation. But where is their source of knowledge? How come nobody knows anything about how these stones were built? What were the stones used for? These questions give rise to the theory of the natural disaster or the extraterrestrial body that hit the Earth, wiping out a significant number of the residents. The stone circles were of different architectural design. Some were built standing on top of each other. Others were built standing upright, while the rest were built in bigger circles, resting slightly on top of each other. Excited, surprised, and in awe after visiting the British Isles, French archaeologist Jean-Pierre Mohen in his book Le Monde des Megalithes, wrote that they were outstanding in the abundance of standing stones and the variety of circular architectural complexes of which they formed a part, strikingly original. They had no equivalent elsewhere in Europe, strongly supporting the argument that the builders were independent. Randall strongly believes that some wiped out these civilizations at one point, thousands of years ago. He suggested that researchers should take a clue from the story of Noah's Ark and other forms of massive flooding epic stories. He said that the documentation of these stories does not just prove that their writers had wild imaginations. Carlson opined that these ancient civilizations were attuned to the spirituality of the universe. They communicated a lot of things in different ways. After they were gone, remnants of this lost knowledge could be found in mythology, religious texts, and ancient symbols across different cultures. These ancient symbols and texts may contain tame references to real events and the lost technology of these prehistoric civilizations. What could they be thinking about at that time? It just means that they were rewriting history about something that had happened before. He also talked about the symbols found in various times in Egypt that suggest the daily life of our ancestors thousands of years ago. Some mysteries never get old. Anytime we think about them, we are blown away. Typical examples are the megalithic temples standing in Malta. What did the prehistoric residents know about physics? The oldest freestanding temples of Malta. The ancient freestanding temples in Malta were built during three distinct periods, approximately between 3600 BC and 2500 BC. They are allegedly the oldest freestanding structures on Earth and they were built with the bizarre understanding of advanced physics and gravity. Archaeologists believe that these megalithic complexes are the result of local innovations in a process of cultural evolution. They refuse to believe that the prehistoric residents may have had a more enhanced understanding of the Earth than we do. The structure of these temples is weirdly unique, with the signature heavy stones used for building. When archaeologists decided to study the purpose of these temples and how they were built, they found something that would blow their minds. The sites that these temples were built on were evolutionary. This means that for every successful temple they built in the prehistoric era, they had to learn more about the architectural uniqueness. Maybe the layout had to be different because the site had become sloppy, or maybe they had to add smaller structures around the temple that they already built. Every successful megalithic structure came with its kind of architectural refinement. But how were these temples built? The approach to the temples lies on an oval forecourt, leveled by terracing if the terrain is sloping. The forecourt is bounded on one side by the temple's facades, which face south or southeast. 
In our modern world, engineers try to get to the ground even before they build anything on it. But it was different in the ancient era. They created a better architecture that would fit every site they worked on. The main variation in the temples lay in the number of apses found. This may vary to three, four, five, or six. If three, they open directly from the central court in a trefoil fashion. The external walls were usually built of coralline limestone, but another type of stone was used for the carvings. These temples had decorative sculptures and designs linked to vegetative or animal symbolism. These usually depict running spiral motifs, trees, and plants, as well as a vast selection of animals. Many scientists would argue that the prehistoric era could never have the technological advancement we have. They knew nothing about trigonometry and Pythagoras because these theories were discovered thousands of years later. There was also no way they would understand math symbols or calculations. They did not have phones, internet, computers, or satellites, nor were they interested in anything in the cosmos, and the list goes on and on. But there are ancient monumental structures around the world built by men that suggest that they knew a lot more about the Earth than we may ever know. They had advanced technology. And that's all for now. Drop your thoughts in the comment below. And do well to like this video and subscribe too to see more enlightening content like this. Thank you for watching.